Well, hello everyone, and welcome to yet another educational webinar from the Federation of State Boards of Physical Therapy. My name is Joni Kalis, and I'm a member of the FSBPT's Board of Directors. I'm broadcasting to you today from Lincoln City, Oregon, where winter is coming. We have very cloudy skies and a slight drizzle. I'm so happy though that you were able to join us this afternoon for this webinar because you're in for a real treat. Our presentation is entitled Emerging Areas of Practice and Scope of Practice Clarification. As with all emerging areas of practice, there are new regulatory considerations and public perception issues. Today, we're not going to talk about just one, but four emerging areas of practice. One, animal physical therapy, which, by the way, is newly added to the seventh edition of the Model Practice Act. Department of Transportation physical exams, sports physical exams, and pelvic health pessary fitting. We are so fortunate to have an amazing lineup of speakers today. Steve Allison is a physical therapist and a certified Department of Transportation medical examiner. He is an expert in and has focused his practice on functional capacity evaluations, functional employment testing, job analysis, and as a consultant on disability cases. Our next expert, Kim Parker Guerrero, hails from Roswell, New Mexico, and we all know a lot of interesting things go on in Roswell. Kim specializes in pelvic and abdominal health physical therapy and is the owner of Renew Physical Therapy. Kirk Peck is a physical therapist and professor at Creighton University, as well as an instructor in the University of Tennessee's certif certification program in equine rehab. Kirk collaborates with vets to rehab canine clients and is the current SIG liaison to World Physio Animal PT Network. And last, but certainly not least, we have Rick Wickstrom. Say that fast six times. Rick is a physical therapist, a certified ergonomist, and a certified medical examiner. His practice includes functional employment exams, FCEs, worker accommodation studies, and ergonomic job analysis. He hails from the Ohio State University, need I say more. <laughs> Participants, we want to hear from you. So if you have a question, please just post it in the chat and we'll be taking all of those questions at the end of the program. If you have, be so warned, if you have a complicated question, a two-part question, something really long, we may ask you to unmute and come on camera and ask the expert yourself. So without further ado, Kirk, take it away. Thank you, Joni. It was a very wonderful introduction to all of us. I appreciate that greatly. Not drizzling here in Nebraska. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's very sunny and beautiful today. I am just uh, gonna highlight initially, and I'll be back speaking later in this webinar uh, on my passionate area of practice in animal physical therapy. But one of the things we wanna highlight that kind of sets the tone for all of the speakers today is a document that's been published on the Federation of State Board of PT website for some time, but really needs to be highlighted for all state boards and regulatory bodies that are really looking at scope of practice changes. And the document is titled, Changes in Healthcare Professions, Scope of Practice, Legislative Considerations. Um, there is a web link at the bottom on this uh, particular slide. And although this is published in May 2006, when you read it, you'll feel like it was just written yesterday. It is so applicable to everything we're speaking about today. Next slide. So one of the things I highlight about this document is it wasn't just written by physical therapists as a group. As you can see on here, it was a collaborative approach with an interprofessional perspective. And so highlighted in red, you'll see all the participants that put forth their thought process on changing regulation and state um, scopes of practice. So you, we had not only physical therapy, but social work, medical boards, pharmacy, occupational therapy, and nursing involved. So it makes this document a very well-rounded and robust perspective on scope of practice change. Next slide. So it is a must read. It is a document that if you pull through, highlighted on here with a couple bullets are kind of the general scope of the table of contents that are covered in the document. Um, things like legislative context and history are important when reviewing a potential scope of practice change. And what's the background setting, which also is very specific to each jurisdiction. And then the purpose of regulation in defining scope, which is really important to 
kind of to review and look at that because what really is the role of regulatory boards and regulation of scopes of practice? And then how there are those defined uh, is extremely important because definitions do change over time. And then definition and assumptions that are related to scope of practice are discussed in the document, um, which I think bring light to how you, it's a good review of even your own particular jurisdiction scope and regulations. And then finally, there's some excellent discussion on decision making for change in scope of practice. What really constitutes the reason to make a change in the first place? Next slide. So the main assumptions that you walk away with in this document is to look at an overriding component of professional competencies do overlap. So a few very important points to make here. Um, practice interventions do evolve over time, thank goodness, so that we are an advancing profession like all professions are. And evidence is needed to support quality and access. Um, so evidence does have to have a background of to, to make scope changes and regulation. And then the most paramount of all, which anyone working as on a board in any jurisdiction knows, public safety is paramount. So therefore, things are going to be looked at on what are the educational requirements or continuing competency requirements and those elements that go into all the things we do as practitioners. So those are some key highlights of this document. If nothing else, I want to make it an, as an awareness to everyone on this webinar and others who may watch in the future how important it is to, to review this. Excellent resource by the Federation. Okay, next slide. So now I'm gonna pass the baton and I'll have Kim Parker Guerrero speak about pessary fitting and management and she'll take on and I'll return later on animal physical therapy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, I'm speaking to you today uh, as a representative of the Academy of Pelvic Health. I'm the director of practice. And as was mentioned, I practice in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, next slide. Hope you can hear me. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk today about pest refitting and management. And I included a picture of just one type. There's several types. Um, but a pessary is a device inserted into the vaginal canal for conservative management of pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse or POP uh, and stress urinary incontinence, which is SUI uh, abbreviated. Next slide. And it's a condition characterized by descent of the pelvic organs beyond their anatomical positions. And it can result in the alteration in the anterior vaginal wall, posterior vaginal wall, the cervix or uterus, apex of the vagina, or the rectum. Next slide. And so patients will come to us usually and they'll say they have a visible va vaginal bulge, pelvic pressure, they're having problem urinating or voiding, they're having problem uh, defecating, uh, or they're having sexual dysfunction or pain. And these symptoms can greatly affect a patient's quality of life. And by 2050, the pelvic organ prolapse rate in the United States is expected to increase by about 50%, secondary to the aging population incident rate peaking in those ages 70 to 79. Next slide. So the benefit of pessary is for our patients. Uh, I talked a little bit of what their symptoms are. So they get symptom relief. It, you get prevention of pelvic organ prolapse progression. They have improved body image. They maintain control of urinary incontinence. They have improved quality of life. The big thing, it's very low risk and low cost to a patient compared to a surgical option. There's an increased ability to return to physical activity or exercise. And I point this out because a lot of times we have women, young women to through all ages that um, come looking for pessary fitting. Pessaries are safe and well tolerated and they should be considered as a first line of treatment for urinary incontinence or prolapse. Next slide. So just a background on pessary fitting and physical therapy. So physical therapists in the UK, Australia, and uh, Canada have been fitting pessaries for a while. Physical therapists in the U.S. have the foundational knowledge and the skill set to provide pessary fittings. We have extensive knowledge of pelvic anatomy and treatment of pelvic health conditions, and our expertise includes treatment of pelvic organ prolapse through functional modifications, exercise, and manual therapy. Next slide. So the advantage of having a pelvic health PT fit the pessaries 
because of the frequency we see our patients in our treatment sessions, we can help identify tissue changes, ill-fitting pessaries, changes in vaginal or genital health, or a need for referral back to physician. And pelvic floor PTs are trained in orthotic fitting, and a pessary is an orthotic for the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor PTs who are trained in pessary fitting also help improve access to care for many of these patients and ease pessary fitting barriers. And I can speak from uh, practicing in New Mexico that one of the reasons why uh, I started performing pessary fitting and got trained in it, it was a six month to one year wait for patients uh, to get a pessary, to get in to see a midwife, uh, OBGYN or anyone and they, a lot of them weren't even doing it anymore. So uh, it's been a, a great uh, access for my patients. Next slide. So the Academy of Pelvic Health had a task force and we uh, did a position, uh, issued a position statement and the task force identified competencies needed for pest refitting and uh, to also tell our members to first check within the scope of practice and the respective state practice act to complete a hands-on pest refitting and management course that included both didactic, didactic and lab-based pest reassessment with a series of mentored case studies, uh, ensure competency and tactile fitting and didactic coursework to perform a detailed internal pelvic assessment to rule out contraindications to pest refitting are indications of epithelial abnormalities with pest reuse, and that uh, they stay up to date with current medical literature regarding pest care to ensure alignment of practice with our current evidence-based guidelines. Next slide. We also recommended collaboration, so that the uh, PT would collaborate and communicate often with medical professionals involved in the patient's urogynecological care, that they refer high-risk patients to advanced medical providers for clearance prior to pest refitting, uh, and they refer patients to a PCP, OBGYN, urogynecologist, gastroenterologist, or other advanced medical provider if epithelial abnormalities or erosions occur with a pessary. Next slide. So some of the examples of high-risk patients can include but aren't, li aren't limited to pregnancy, cognitive impairment, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, urinary retention, or vaginal dermatosis, which is, uh, and I listed two uh, conditions here. If the advanced medical provider refers a patient to public floor PT, but they document that the high-risk condition is adequately managed, then the pest refitting by the public floor PT can proceed with continued communication with the advanced medical provider. And one of those examples was the uh, the menopausal syndromes. And here I just wanted to uh, show some examples of uh, courses the, that the Academy has sponsored. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to one of the inaugural ones at John Hopkins in Baltimore last December. We have several scheduled. Um, and then there's also other hands-on courses that are uh, provided by other entities for competencies. Next slide. So in summary, the Academy of Public Health endorses pest refitting and management provided by qualified public health physical therapists. And we truly believe that pest refitting and management is within the scope of physical therapy practice in the US and its five US territories. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rick Wickstrom, and I'm speaking to you about an emerging area of practice uh, of sports participation in physicals that is very relevant to our APTA vision statement of transforming society by optimizing movement to improve human performance. When I was a, a student at the Ohio State University, uh, I had an opportunity to, to participate in APTA's con student conclave that was led by Shirley Sarman, who uh, basically motivated me to kind of focus on participation-based and functional fitness for duty evaluations from, um, from, from in all aspects of disability. Um, 
I, I will focus my, most of my presentation on the youth athletes um, because I believe that the organizational policies and procedures for this participation focused screen have a negative um, impact on the perception of physical therapists at, as entry care, uh, entry point of care providers in all sectors of physical therapy practice. Now, my sweet spot in practice is occupational health. Um, I'm currently serving as the president of the Occupational Health Special Interest Group in the APT Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. I don't profess to be an expert in sports physical therapy. However, I do uh, view sports pre-participation evaluations as a relatively simple participation-focused physical examination compared to other examinations, uh, such as the DOT physical exams that I do of commercial truck drivers as a certified medical examiner, as well as complex functional capacity evaluations and, and providing legal testimony on issues of physical impairment, disability, and job accommodation. Next slide. Oh, keep that one. I'm, I'm sorry. Go back one. Okay, so I, as an introduction, um, I had the opportunity after the 2021 um, House of Delegates, uh, I, I watched it uh, as sort of a bystander or interested participant. And that experience motivated me to, uh, to um, originate a new motion for the 2022 House of Delegates, um, working in collaboration with uh, the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, and uh, in particular, um, credits to Jim, James Spencer, who is the chief delegate and now serves as the vice president of AOPT. And um, the reason why I felt like this language on access to physical therapists as entry point practitioners was important was because I felt like it went across all sectors. It was a common theme that impacted our ability to practice in all areas of practice. And, um, and we wanted some specific language in this motion that would perhaps influence the uh, upcoming uh, 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 FSBPT Model Practice Act and also the current um, standards of practice uh, uh, and, and changes to that, to get language in there that related to um, things such as uh, determining the cause and nature of conditions and medical problems, as well as um, just stresses our strength and expertise related to participation focused um, examinations. And so this language basically um, states very clearly that, that we support unrestricted access to physical therapists as entry point practitioners for, for activity participation, wellness, health, and disability determination. Next slide. And um, through, um, through collaboration with APTA staff and, and other members of the uh, um, FSBPT, um, I was very pleased to see that um, on the heels of our motion in the latest update of the Model Practice Act is language that says that our scope includes participation focused physical examinations um, that, that is, was directly relevant to our motion. So that was a that was a big win from uh, from our perspective. We, we were hoping to influence some some better and clear language um, in there about uh, our strengths in this area. And the sports participation exam is just one part of it because um, um, a big part of our rationale was centered around opportunities for physical therapists in practice settings such as um, such as sports uh, participation or activity clearance for older adults. Next slide. So the um, on the heels of that, um, it, it you know we, we began to see some changes in APTA um, and also in um, in the, the the language that describes our scope of practice. But I was felt very good when the the, the Michigan, even though I'm an Ohio State fan, you know we don't we have this love hate relationship with. Uh, Michigan uh, that goes back to the Woody Hayes days. And, uh, but I was so pleased to see the Michigan chapter actually introduce a charge to develop better resources to position physical therapists as leaders in health promotion, injury prevention, and physical activity programs. Um, the, um, the intended outcome of 
1523 was to foster better coordination between academies, public relations, and advocacy resources within APTA. And um, this motion was needed because although we have content experts in the Health Promotion and Wellness Council, and within uh, the the motion is critical to um, um, APTA's mission, and uh, and and multiple academies. Uh, need to be coordinating better to advance this area of practice. And, and that requires additional APTA resources and infrastructure to drive opportunities to physical therapists in uh, participation-based um, evaluations and also to um, meet or exceed the competencies of primary care providers, such as nurse practitioners, when conducting a participation-focused examination for activity clearance and disability determination. Our, um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about the um, uh, youth sports situation, I don't perceive there to be any uh, negative regulatory language in any state chapters that would prevent a physical therapist from uh, playing a role in the sports pre-participation uh, physical examination. I bring up this example from Ohio, um, but, but know that um, there is a national federation of state high school as associations that re recommends that every student athlete should have a pre-placement physical examination before they participate in sports. And some of that goes back to the days when there were access to care barriers, which is the public uh, perception issue, and it was felt that maybe the only time that a, a child would see a healthcare practitioner would be if they had, a, had to go for a sports participation exam. Um, the, um, and that certainly has changed in terms of the, uh, um, uh, under Obamacare and, and some of those provisions for wellness. But the, um, the National High School Athletic Association or Federation of High School a Association, they have no authority over individual state high school athletic associations. And so really the practice barrier in, in, all, in these states is that the state APTA chapters must advocate with the state high school athletic association to authorize and list physical therapists as an examiner type on the form that's completed. And uh, the purpose for this type of participation physical exam is not to exclude um, the, the the student athlete from participating in sports, but rather to promote safe participation. Next slide. So I, I brought up an example of the form. Um, although, again, although there's no regulatory barriers, um, physical therapists are not listed as practitioners because the uh, the guidelines for performing sports participation physical exams are, are done largely by medical associations, and there's no representation by physical therapists on those guidelines. It's the societies for like pediatric physicians and societies for uh, medical doctors and osteopathic doctors and the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, but physical therapists don't really have a lot of say. And But, but what they've done is they have developed... Um, um, forms, which they, they provide um, complementary to all the state associations. And, uh, and they're typical, like in Ohio, um, you'll see this form actually has DC listed on the form. That's not one of the standard forms from, um, this was modified by the state association because the doctors of chiropractic uh, were successful in advocating for inclusion as a, as a practitioner that can perform sports participation exams. Uh, so this is an issue that may came up, come up before state physical therapy boards or the opinions of state physical therapy boards may go a long way towards convincing a um, high school athletic association to include physical therapists among the credentials that can complete this. And, and it's any of you that are parents as I am, I have, I have eight children. And so uh, it got kind of a little hectic running the kids back and forth for all their activities to get sports um, participation clearance. And so I, I did some of the uh, sports exams myself until I was um, told by the school athletic trainer that I wasn't qualified to do so. And so that, um, 
um, that's that that was one part of the rationale that I think is it just sets such a negative precedent, not only to the uh, student early on that physical therapists are not entry point practitioners, but also to their parents who are probably just on the verge of needing to have physical therapists for the first time in li their lives themselves. Next slide. It may interest you to know that on the federal level, there are also organizational barriers imposed that, that physical activity clearance is limited to licensed medical professionals who are qualified to conduct exams and prescribe medications. This prescribed medications um, area kind of really gets under my skin because really we're doing a participation focused exam and, and, and how well we can prescribe, a, a provider can prescribe a medicine um, does, seems to have little bearing on that participation. We certainly have to know the uh, negative effects and, and, and health conditions associated with medications that are being taken uh, for, for any reason uh, when doing an exam, but um, to make the, the qualification based on prescribing medication uh, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. And APTA is actually a uh, sponsor, um, a, a, an important sponsor of the Special Olympics. And it's my hope that as we, as we gain more traction in, in providing clearance for a physical therapist to provide clearance in various states, that we can also then use that um, um, groundswell to also influence the Special Olympics uh, because uh, they, they certainly have much more interesting and, uh, and challenging needs that relate to participation that, that most medical uh, and, or traditional healthcare providers don't uh, get a lot of exposure to in their, um, in their, in their schooling. Next slide, please. So I spoke a little bit about the root cause of sports per organizational barriers. And these are organizational barriers, not licensing barriers. And um, like I said, the, the, these are consensus-based guidelines. They, are, they, they clearly state, and this book is available. I've got a copy on my bookshelf. It's, uh, it has some very good information, but they clearly state at the beginning of the book that it was not developed as an evidence-based process. And there's a lack of outcomes data to, de to de demonstrate that it's even effective. Uh, there was a study by uh, Strickler that found that only two of 20,000 some youth sports participation exams had major findings that limited um, sports participation. And another survey found that 26% uh, of physicians that did sports participation said they didn't even usually perform a physical exam as part of their clearance process. So, you know, this is, a, in my mind, this, this is an entry point wellness opportunity. That's really what it was intended uh, from the very beginning. And, um, and I, I think it's an important entry point wellness opportunity for all areas of practice. There are pediatric physical therapists that work at schools. And we know that uh, oftentimes um, kids and adults have access barriers to get to like medical practices where they can get to these kinds of restrictions. And if you eliminate that transportation barrier or you make provisions for the person, to, for, for a therapist to come on site to do the evaluations, then we're also uh, promoting a form of public protection. But again, the, the root cause that we're not included on this is that basically all of these um, state high school athletic associations typically have like a, uh, a medical association attached to them that, um, that, that provides guidance on these things. And they're all, um, I would say, quite biased against um, uh, practitioners that don't prescribe medications. Next slide. So I want to use this as kind of a segue to the Federal Motor Carrier Association and just tell you a little bit about my story. Um, when COVID happened, my private practice literally shut down and I was um, scratching my head trying to figure out how I could reinvent myself. And um, I was uh, pretty interested in what my colleague, Steve Allison, who I'll be handing the mic off to, was doing in Louisiana as a uh, certified medical examiner. So I proceeded um, very quickly to, um, to investigate the process that Steve went through and uh, working with my Ohio licensing board. And, uh, and in Ohio, we have a fantastic relationship between our Ohio chapter and the licensing board. In fact, I know most of the members of the licensing board uh, on a first name basis. And, um, and I was able to very quickly um, obtain the, a, a prerequisite letter 
that said that it's within my scope of practice to do this type of evaluation from the Ohio Licensing Board um, and, and allows me to proceed the, proceed to do that. And at the same time, not too long after that, and I actually went through a board certification, which Steve will explain more fully, uh, I was I, I also applied to the Kentucky Board of Physical Therapy and um, and I had a few. Um, it was that was a, they were also a very collegial uh, board that allowed uh, me to participate by Zoom with them. And when they had questions and issues, I was actually able to bring Steve Allison on as sort of an expert that was always already established doing the service area to further explain some of the areas that had questions about and, and some of the questions that came up. Um, during my process with the Ohio and also with the Kentucky board were questions such as, well, we don't teach this particular evaluation procedure in school. So how could it be in our, our scope of practice? You know, like, you know, and that, that issue was brought up to me in relationship to, uh, they do a little simple dipstick urine test. that doesn't require you to be a, 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 a uh, even a licensed medical professional to do that. And they do a vision screen, which I routinely do in all of my functional evaluations. Uh, they do a loud whisper test, which is kind of a low tech kind of thing. But some of these, as these issues kind of came up, I, I was able to um, respond to the licensing board in a very collegial manner and ultimately um, uh, got got privileges both in Ohio and Kentucky, uh, which are, are the states that I'm primarily licensed in. And I'm just very appreciative of that type of collegial relationship, that customer service relationship that those two boards have given me. So at this point, I just want to show you, um, if you go to the last slide for me, Jeff. Um, these are just examples of the two letters that I had to get to, to um, basically just clarify to the FMCSA um, uh, of the U.S. Department of Transportation that it is within my scope of practice. And then I was able to proceed with the mandatory education that was necessary to really learn their process and to apply their, their guidelines in the way that they should be. And then also I had to take a national board certification exam to further validate my competency in this area as well. But if, but if it wasn't for the licensing boards to cooperate and send this letter to, the, um, to FMCSA, then I would have, uh, they wouldn't have permitted me to sit for the board exam. So at this point, I think I can go ahead and hand off to, to Steve and uh, I appreciate your time. And, uh, and uh, he'll uh, I'm sure explain a little bit better on how the DOT physical exam is actually much more highly standardized and complex and involves more training than any of us, uh, any type of healthcare provider that does a sports pre-participation pre physical exam. Hey, welcome everyone and thanks for a uh, great presentation. My goal today is to provide you with evidence that will hopefully convince you that performing DOT physical exams is within the scope of practice for PTs, but only those PTs who complete the FMCSA require DOT specific training and pass the National DOT Medical Examiner Certification Examination. So in this presentation, we'll look at three primary sources of evidence that will help you make the right determination. Next slide. So in 2012, the FMCSA created a certification process for healthcare practitioners interested in becoming DOT medical examiners. And the purpose of the National Registry program was to produce certified DOT medical examiners that understand federal regulations and medical advisory guidelines or criteria related to commercial motor vehicle, which I'll refer to as CMV drivers, fitness for duty, and an end goal to reduce CMV related injuries and deaths. So only healthcare practitioners who are listed on FMCSA's national registry can issue a medical examiner's certificate of a CMV driver's fitness for duty. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the FMCSA medical examiner's certificate form that indicates uh, CMV driver certification period, one year, two years, or et cetera, and any restrictions that they may have. So the maximum time frame a CMV driver may be certified is two years. However, DOT medical examiners may certify for less than two years based on the driver's health history, physical examination findings, 
federal regulations and medical advisory guidelines. Next slide, please. So the, the DOT medical examiner path to certification is a four-step process with one major bump in the road during the first step, and that is state board verification of scope of practice to perform physical examinations. So the FMCSA uses two criteria to identify healthcare practitioners who are eligible to become DOT medical examiners. And that's one is professional licensure and two is scope of practice to perform physical examinations. Next slide. So if you click on the registration online tab, you will be taken to this page and there are drop down menus for licensed state and medical profession. So in this example, I chose Louisiana and doctor of physical therapy. You see a green border around those two boxes indicating a green light to move forward with registration. Next slide. However, if you uh, see here in this slide, I've selected Montana and DPT. The two boxes are bordered with an amber color and a warning pops up on the screen notifying me that the FMCSA will contact the state PT board to determine if it's within my scope of practice to perform DOT physical examinations in that state. Next slide. So due to an update to the FMCSA website, many states that have not been clarified for PT scope of practice, so there's been no determination or decision uh, because there's been no request, they're displaying as a red border around the, the medical profession and a red highlighted message indicating that the state PT board has notified the FMCSA that it's not within the scope of practice for PTs from that state to perform DOT physical exams. And again, that's an error that we need to correct. Um, I've verified and went through every state uh, in the U.S., including the District of Columbia, and every one of them that I look at have this red error message. Next slide. So uh, the FMCSA would like each PT state licensing board to send an email letter requesting the FMCSA template letter and other relevant documents when issuing a clarification letter that DOT physical exams are within the scope of practice for the doctor of physical therapy and physical therapists. Um, I mentioned both of that because both um, DPT and PT because they have both um, on their uh, registry and um, so you want to, would want to make it clear that it applies to both in your um, in your letter. And the contact person here is listed on this slide. Next slide. So currently, uh, PT licensing boards in six states have notified the FMCSA that it's within the scope of practice for PTs licensed in their states to perform the DOT physical examination required by the FMCSA. I think we're we're aware of only one state so far that had a um, uh, that that it, um, submitted a letter back to the FMCSA indicating that it was not within the scope of practice for PTs to perform DOT physical examinations. But I don't think that the board had all of the uh, information uh, prior to making that determination. Next slide. So my story. Um, so I hit a bump in the road in my path to certification back in the fall of 2014. So during the first step of registering, I received the amber colored caution notice like we saw earlier. After about six months, I had not received any type of notification from the FMCSA. So I contacted the chief of medical programs at FMCSA to check my registration status. And unfortunately, I was told that the Louisiana PT board had determined it was not within the scope of practice for PTs in Louisiana to perform all of the testing required in the DOT physical exam. So I ended up um, being able to arrange a meeting with the Louisiana PT board and the board attorney to present evidence similar to what I'm presenting today. And after seeing the evidence, the Louisiana PT board made the right decision, issued a letter of clarification to the FMCSA noting that it was within the scope of practice for PTs in Louisiana to perform DOT physical examinations. Next slide. So I went on to complete the required DOT medical examiner training and then pass the National Registry DOT medical examiner certification examination. So after the FMCSA verified my PT license was active and did standing, I received this certificate 
uh, noting that I was officially listed on the National Registry. Next slide. So Title 49 of the Code of Federal Regulations defines physical qualification standards or federal regulations and then advisory criteria, which are medical guidelines for CMV drivers. So it's a fundamental obligation as a DOT medical examiner to determine if a driver has a condition that would interfere with their ability to safely operate a CMV. So in other words, is the CMV driver fit for duty? And that's key here to understand because we're not diagnosing and we're not treating, we're just assessing uh, fitness for duty. Next slide. So the CMV driver will complete a health history questionnaire using the standardized form and the information is reviewed by the DOT medical examiner. The medical examiner will obtain clarification for any yes or not sure answers and uses professional judgment um, to determine if a condition is um, under control and well stabilized or if it would interfere with the driver's ability to safely operate a CMV. In some cases, the DOT medical examiner may require further information in order to make a determination, such as requesting treating physician specialist medical records, or um, also referral to another medical practitioner for further evaluation of the condition. So if you uh, may find an individual that has significant high blood pressure, which is the most common condition that we see here, and referring them back to the primary care to try to get that under control. Next slide. So items on this page of the DOT physical testing uh, can be done by any licensed staff member, unlicensed, I'm sorry, unlicensed staff member with in-house training. Uh, these are some of the things like Rick was mentioning here, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, doing visual acuity testing with a Snellen chart, uh, assessing the ability of the driver to recognize and distinguish between the colors green, amber, and red. Uh, a basic hearing test, which is called a forced whisper test, where you're just whispering words and numbers uh, at a certain distance away and um, the, the driver's positioned a certain way and see if they can hear in each ear. Um, so if vision standards are not met, it would likely trigger a referral to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist for further evaluation. And if the hearing standard is not met, it would likely trigger a referral to an audiologist for audi audiometric testing against the standards. Um, the urinalysis, again, this is a simple over-the-counter dipstick test, which is, I've got one here, I've got these color codes on the back. So uh, these are over-the-counter, anyone can buy them. Um, and, and basically you're just looking at uh, levels of specific gravity, protein, blood, or glucose. And if there's an abnormal finding, then again, it may trigger a recommendation that they follow up with a primary care for further evaluation. So if we find elevated glucose in the urine based off the urine dipstick, we're gonna recommend that they um, go back to see the primary care physician uh, for further workup, make sure that they don't have uh, a condition such as diabetes that has not been diagnosed. Next slide. So the, the DOT physical examination, uh, medical examiners are responsible for conducting this part of the uh, evaluation. So the physical exam consists of 14 body systems and for each system, we know whether findings were either normal or abnormal. Uh, the physical exam of the various body systems are routinely performed by PTs uh, practicing in uh, primary care roles as, was, as well as other PT specialty practice areas uh, such as occupational health. So, uh, for example, uh, the exam of the eyes, we're just looking at equal reaction of both pupils to light, evidence of nystagmus, evaluation of extraocular movements, and then the presence of glasses or contacts. Uh, ears, simply just looking at, is there a hearing aid present? Are there any deformities, uh, structural deformities of the ear? Cardiovascular exam would consist of a chest inspection, looking for surgical scars, pacemaker, any abnormal heart sounds uh, and signs of heart disease such as distended neck veins. So the DOT medical examiner should make a determination and note on this form whether or not the abnormal condition would interfere with the driver's ability to safely operate a CMV. Again, we're looking at fitness for duty. Um, we're not diagnosing and we're not treating. So any abnormal findings, again, may also warrant referral to the driver's primary care physician or a physician specialist for further medical evaluation of the condition to help the DOT medical examiner make the determination for public safety. 
Next slide. So uh, some evidence here from CAPTI that deep PT professional education adequately prepares PTs to perform physical exams, certainly with more emphasis on the musculoskeletal and neurological systems. However, all body systems relevant to the DOT physical exams that we uh, just saw on the FMCSA form are covered to some extent uh, as required by CAPTI, and these physical exam skills can be further refined by attending post-professional continuing ed programs related to DOT physical exams, as well as other training as required by the FMCSA. Next slide. So the National Physical Therapy Examination PT test content outline provides further evidence of PT examination skills in basically all of the same body systems with up to 50 test questions related to physical examination. Next slide. The DOT medical examiner certification test content outline is a little more generic, but you'll see a total of 25 test questions out of 100 relate to physical examination and evaluation at different cognitive levels. And that's under the uh, section, uh, if you look at row 1B and go across. Uh, next slide. So this is a sample test question from an F FMCSA publication that demonstrates the focus for the DOT medical examiner role on fitness for duty. So read the question to you, and then I want you to, to kind of just select an answer write it down and then we'll discuss it. So during this visit to the medical examiner, the driver complains of severe pain in his finger for the last two weeks after it was punctured. The examination reveals an infected swollen finger. After the medical examiner inquires, the driver states that the pain is made worse when he grips the steering wheel. Which of the following should the medical examiner do next? Obtain a hand x-ray, assess capillary recall in the hand, obtain a culture and sensitivity, or assess the driver's grip strength. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and then we'll look at the answer. Okay, next slide. So yeah, the correct response is assess the driver's grip strength. Uh, we're looking at fitness for duty. So that would that would be the issue that would affect public safety if they did not have sufficient grip strength because of that infect, infected finger to safely hold and control the steering wheel on the on the truck or bus. Uh, the um, incorrect responses, obtaining a hand x-ray or obtain, obtaining a culture and sensitivity, those are more uh, diagnostic and to determine a treatment plan. And that's not the role of the uh, DOT medical examiner. As well as the, uh, the other option of assessing capillary refill in the hand would be part of an evaluation to, um, again, to determine uh, a diagnosis, um, or a secondary diagnosis and treatment plan. It really has no bearing on their ability to safely operate a uh, commercial motor vehicle. Next slide. So DOT medical examiners are required to adhere to uh, federal regulations related to high blood pressure for CMV drivers. So for example, if a CMV driver comes in with stage one high blood pressure, they can be certified only one time for three months and then the DOT medical examiner would advise the driver to follow up with their primary care physician for further evaluation of the blood pressure problem. The driver would then return to the DOT medical examiner within the three-month certification period for recertification. And at that point, the blood pressure must be less than or equal to 140 over 90 to be recertified for a maximum of one year from the initial exam date. However, if you look at stage three blood pressure, uh, a driver at, with blood pressure at this level cannot be certified for any period of time until they get their blood pressure down to 140 over 90 or less. And then the maximum certification period would be six months at one time for the rest of their CMD driving career. Next slide. So thank you for inviting me to present on this topic. And I hope now with the evidence you have seen that it's will be your determination as PT board members that it's within the scope of practice for PTs to perform DOT physical exams. Now I'm going to pass the, the baton back to Kurt. All right, thanks, Steve. Nice presentation there. I'm going to turn this uh, topic in totally different directions right now and talk a little bit about animal physical therapy and regulatory implications uh, for this. Next slide. 
Um, it is an emerging practice. This actually is uh, a hot topic in, in some states and has been in many other states. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is when I talk about animal physical therapy is primarily treating dogs and horses, but keep keeping something in mind that when you treat equine, I do teach in the equine lab down in Tennessee. Um, we also are working with owners, uh, of course, the veterinarians, uh, number one, but owners, riders, and trainers as well. So a lot of the issues relate to the rider on the back of the horse. Next slide. So there's a lot of national support now for PTs treating animals, which is very exciting. So trying to get laws and regulations changed, we need to have that support. So there is support from both APTA and the Federation of State Boards of PT. Next slide. I'm gonna start with just the uh, opinion statement, uh, position statement, I should say, from the APTA from the House of Delegates. And this has been revised a couple of times. It was originally back in 1993, went through a couple of revisions and in, in 2018 had a revision again. And I won't read the whole thing, but I am gonna highlight in blue what's stated on here from APTA, where it states where allowable by state law and regulation and consistent with the physical therapist's knowledge and skills, physical therapists may establish collaborative collegial relationships with veterinarians for the purpose of providing professional consultation and expertise in movement impairment, fitness, and conditioning for animals. Um, the wording was trying to encompass pretty much largely what uh, a lot of PTs do with this area, but we are actually providing, again, direct physical therapy on animals uh, as well. So um, the support is there from APTA. Next slide. We now, very exciting, as mentioned in the introduction, for the first time in 25 years, which I was uh, very proud to see this finally come to fruition. I was actually serving on the Legislative Committee for the Federation when we were revising some language of the Model Practice Act. But in the seventh edition of the Model Practice Act, we were able to get incorporated, and I was thrilled to see this passed, um, language supporting animal physical therapy as well. So I've, on a, on a cut and paste, just a couple tidbits of the language out of the, the document on the Model Practice Act where this is stated. One, regulation of physical therapy in section 4.03, uh, patient client care management of the Model Practice Act states, nothing in this act shall pro prohibit a license uh, E, a licensee certificate holder from providing physical therapy to animals for which the licensee has completed the education and training as further established by rule. And that's very important because right now the Model Practice Act does not outline what those the terminology or verbiage would be in the rules, but it gives the open door, provides the open door for that to occur on a jurisdictional basis. Next slide. So in the common, corresponding commentary related to that section, the Model Practice Act states the practice of physical therapy continues to evolve, including the treatment of animals. And while there is currently no consistent standard of specified education and training, it is appropriate to note that additional rule development in a jurisdiction may address minimum standards to demonstrate competency to provide physical therapy to animals. Um, so that the support is there, the language is there, the rules will need to be drafted, and they have been in a few states, which I'll highlight in a little bit. Next slide. So I composed a few slides on here to what I consider what regulators need to know if you get involved with, and I actually hope you do, uh, either a question by some who want to change some of the laws or regulations or review what your current state jurisdiction says on this. Um, what regulators need to know. Number one, animal PT is not entry-level PT practice. That is a given. Um, there are additional uh, competencies that need to be covered before treating animals. No national standards for animal PT exist. There's no recognized accreditation criteria for animal PT to date for, for this purpose. And then currently in the U.S., there are only two certification programs, two for small animal and two for equine in the U.S. that even exist. Um, but they do exist, and that is what therapists actually usually go through. They'll get certified through one of these programs in order to treat small or large animal. So a couple of things do exist. We do have the Animal Physical Therapy Special Interest Group. It was founded in 1998. Um, it is an official organization couched under the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy of APTA. So that is an official organization. It's been around for several years. So the voice of those interested in animal PT can be heard. There is also what is known as the Standards of Clinical Practice that is now published uh, on the website for animal PT. 
Um, it is under the SIG website and is based on a formal practice analysis that was done a few years ago as well. It is outlined when you look at it, it'll look like a lot like accreditation standards, how they're drafted, but they're not official accreditation standards. They're simply standards that were based on research done through a practice analysis to show basic practice competencies required to treat animals. Next slide. Currently, and this is important to know, there are only five, and I'm going to very well make this very clear. There are only five states that have intentionally, I highlight that word because there's a lot of states that have loopholes, loopholes that allow PTs to treat animals uh, through usually the veterinary boards or statutes, um, but it is not, never was intentionally codified language that was specific to legally support animal PT. So right now we really only have five states. Um, where it is drafted in PT statutes and regulations is Colorado, New Hampshire, and Utah. And New Hampshire is somewhat unique because when you read their language in the PT Practice Act, they actually reference uh, a collaboration with what the vet board reg recommends uh, for additional training or initial training and things like that. So they actually link the PT and the vet board together a little bit. Uh, Utah just has it in the PT Practice Act without a lot of further uh, delineation of requirements. Um, and then the veterinary statutes and regs, which is another option. Nevada is the oldest state in the U.S. to actually have this uh, put in any codified language whatsoever. And it's well drafted out in the Nevada Board of Regulations. And then in Nebraska, which is the one I worked on a few years ago directly with our veterinary board to draft language. Um, and that now equates to two separate licenses. Uh, to have a license to treat animals, you're actually regulated by the vet board the license to treat humans by the PT board. So we have a long way to go with a lot of states to get this legally really put in codified language. Next slide. So what else do regulators need to know? Well, one point of interest, a question that comes up a lot is the professional liability. Um, HPSO, which uh, is sponsored through APTA, but provides a lot of, a lot of people uh, have professional liability through HPSO. Their standard language in there for anything with animal practice is covered under property damage. So you would look at the property damage amounts, and that's what you would be covered for if a case were to occur. Um, they have a standard $10,000 standard coverage limit, and you can pay for an additional cost up to $25,000. Um, interestingly enough, and misinterpreted by many PTs I talk about with over the country, is that the coverage only applies in states where practice is deemed legal. So just because you're legal to treat humans under this professional liability does not automatically mean you can treat animals. You have to have the additional language to, for treating animals, which is why uh, there's a push to hopefully get this done in more states. Next slide. Okay, so what else is important is a couple things that regulatory bodies should know. And this is one thing that is also covered in the Model Practice Act, which I really appreciate that we now have kind of more of a preferential language. Um, the first thing that needs to occur is for boards and state chapters to go back and see what do our statutes say about what physical therapy is by definition. And when you look at the definition, is are the terms treating humans, persons, or individuals, the terms put into the codified language? in statute and regs. If so, the general interpretation of those is that was not meant for animals, that was meant for human care. And that's why the preferential treatment really through and listed in the Model Practice Act as well as patient client is a preferred language. So the first thing that would help states get over the hurdle of treating animals for PTs is to utilize patient client terminology in their statutes and regulations. Second, in veterinary statutes and regs, these are not the ideal really way for the profession to be regulated, but that, like I mentioned, in Nevada and, and Nebraska is how it is done, um, is an option. Um, PTs lose authority over regulating their own profession, over treating animals. Uh, they kind of relinquish that to the vet board, but that is, uh, a, it is an option that, that has occurred and so far without any issues with that. Okay, next slide. So a couple of things about addressing public safety. These are paramount, and I've worked a lot with therapists around the country and myself included in Nebraska, what I would consider almost somewhat non-negotiable items a little bit. Right now, education is, it is beyond entry level um, and it is a must. Animal-related competencies are needed for PTs to really advance their competency skills to treat animals and to collaborate and to demonstrate to veterinarians that you have the skill set to do that. 
And right now, all the states that I highlighted, uh, veterinary medical clearance um, is required. Um, we do not have, although we have direct access, you know, in all 50 states to some level for human practice of PT, that is not the case with animal care. So the reason this is there is because veterinarians will always advocate for having a medical clearance so that there's a collaborative relationship between PTs and the veterinarians. Okay, so that technically means referral for PT services. And then three, required continuing competency is a must. That really should be outlined in, in the uh, regulations, um, but required by statutes in some ways, but in regulations we'll lay out what are those continuing competencies. And if you look those up in the five states I mentioned, you will see some differences with that as well. And then regulated by a professional board is important for public safety. Um, so actually not having uh, just individuals out there willy nilly without any regulation, essentially being unlicensed practitioners, which does occur and is occurring, unfortunately, right now in a lot of arenas, there are practitioners who are not physical therapists, and they're not veterinarians or vet techs practicing on animals. And that creates a problem because boards regulate licensed professionals. So we have an issue in the field with, with that issue. So we really would prefer in the physical therapy profession to be board regulated. Okay, that's the ideal model. Next slide. And then now's the time for action. This is very timely, but this is emerging practice. For these six reasons I put on here, currently we do have five states that have adopted statutes and regs. So there are examples to look at in those states. Two, we have support from APTA, uh, and with the, in addition to the Animal PT SIG, as mentioned, as an organization that supports Animal PT. Three, now the Federation of State Board of PT has the Model Practice Act, which includes Animal PT. And we have published standards for animal clinical practice. Uh, it's a document in the public domain posted again on the, on the APT, APTA's Animal SIG website. So please check that out. Continuing competencies exist for animal PT. There is a lot of con ed courses around where veterinarians, vet techs, and PTs are invited to and, and collaborate together in those con ed format. And then honestly, in the United States, a lot of people don't realize how long this has been going on. PTs have actually been practicing on animals since the 1970s, but it's taken many years for it to really get legally codified language. Unfortunately, a lot of PTs will work as a tech or an aid under a vet in order to treat animals because they want to do this. Uh, but we're really trying to get this regulated so PTs can function and call themselves a physical therapist without violating their own term and title of their own profession while they're treating animals. So they can actually call it physical therapy. Next slide. So finally, I'm gonna end with this. The questions that really hang out there are regulatory bodies have to ask this question is, which professional board should really regulate PTs treating animals? Should it be PT or vet boards? Again, we have two examples in the US that currently exist. It's a question every board needs to ask themselves with that. And number two, even if you don't have laws that are codified for physical therapists and statutes and regulations, will PT regulatory boards still accept animal-based CE courses for credit? Um, and I hear different things about this in different states. And the questions now coming up is, well, what if it's a PT, and in many cases, they are physical therapists who are treating their main instructors of the course, and they are treating theory uh, in practice of physical therapy. It just happens to be on a different species. So the question is, why can there at least not be some credit given for Con Ed for those courses? Because it's a deterrent for some PTs to even take these courses in Con Ed, uh, even just to learn about this when they feel like they can't get CE credit. So I will finish with those two questions. Next slide. I just want to thank everybody for listening to all of our presentations today and, uh, and the, having patience to hear through this. And I will end with that. Next slide. Well, that was absolutely terrific. A great job, panelists. You know, I think sometimes in PT, we don't really think we have many emerging areas of practice, but you have all shown us otherwise. So thank you for that. We do have a couple of Come on, Mouse. We do have a couple of requests and questions in the chat. Um, the first one there is for Steve. Can you share a letter template um, that you send? Sure. Uh, I, we can share. Rick has several too from Kentucky and Ohio, and I can share some that um, I have possession of from Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. Um, and Steve, this is Jeff Rose. If you email that to Rich, 
we can make sure that we get it out to everyone that is um, attending today. Okay, sounds good. And I, this is Rick. I would just add that um, we've got the letters that are, have been customarily issued in other states, but but I have been dialoguing directly with the FMCSA um, contact there, and they've informed us that they have a template letter themselves that if the state is interested in, in issuing a letter of support, they can request not just the, the template letter, but also the regulations that they want to make sure the state has so they can see the latest um, updates on the regulations. And that's one of the slides that Steve presented in his report. So I, we've got North Dakota, which is the most recent one. I've got, I've got Ohio and Kentucky, and Steve has Louisiana, Arkansas, and maybe even Texas, I don't know. Um, but we, we've, we've got those letters that have been just issued using the language that is acceptable to the PT board uh, to go from. Terrific, thank, thank you both Steve and Rick. Uh, Jonathan writes, the Idaho Licensing Board has deferred to me with the Idaho chapter to establish that performing the DOT examinations is within the scope of practice. I have been able to go through the PT Practice Act and can, and can provide specific statute as evidence for all aspects of the exam, except for the year analysis. What evidence is there that I can use to justify the year analysis is within our scope? Well, you know, again, this is an over-the-counter uh, dipstick test. So it doesn't require any type of medical license to do it. Um, you know, people can go in and buy these and do these at home. And it really doesn't require any special training. It's just a set of instructions that come with the urine uh, test strips. And you would uh, read this across here and get the level of, of glucose or protein um, et cetera, in the urine, and then determine if that's abnormal. Um, you don't learn it in PT school, and I don't think that, uh, you know, other professions are learning something that's over the counter in, in their professional training as well. It's, it's just something very basic and uh, doesn't require any special training. Rick, you have anything else to add? Yeah, well, and certain laboratory kinds of tests and devices, some of them require, um, um, they're, they're what we call CLIA waived, um, meaning that, that that you don't have to uh, um, administer those um, as a specific licensed type of medical professional. I think in, in with regard to this year analysis, um, it really, it, it this part of the exam can actually be performed by a non-licensed personnel that receives just um, site-specific training. Um, and, and the same is, is true for other kinds of devices where like may, maybe like we collect the urine sample and send it in for a certified laboratory to perform the analysis. But I don't think the physical therapist is actually doing the analysis. They're just reading the result and reporting the results that were performed on that um, type of analysis. And, and and I really don't see it any different than any of you. Um, as I do, I check my blood sugar. Um, it, it's, you know, that's a much more invasive uh, 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 finger, if little finger step kind of thing than just collect, putting a strip in, in urine and just noting whether there's any um, possibility that the person might have uh, an early indication of of diabetes that's never been checked. And, and good luck getting drivers to uh, to, to go get their blood sugar checked and to participate in wellness-based programs. If it wasn't for this exam um, and as an entry point opportunity, we wouldn't be directing them back to primary care doctors that would, would detect maybe those diabetic issues at a much earlier stage. So saliva, urinalysis, um, um, you know, whatever that particular approach is, I think it's it's important just to look at the whether, whether there's actually any regulations in the state that would would prevent a physical therapist from administering that test, and uh, and it, it and and th that tends to only apply to the the uh, the really like what I call forensic tests, where they're looking for um, unusual kinds of um, of 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 conditions such as you know oxycontin and things like that. Uh, uh, but it's th this is a very simple screening 
laboratory tests, just like the vision exam is a very screening laboratory test that basically just raises a, a flag for further referral before I, as the DOT examiner, clears the person to drive. Um, it's, it's just a form of, of almost mandatory follow-up so that we make sure that they are treating with an attending provider that can follow up on that issue and that they don't feel that it imposes an issue to drive. Great. Thank you, Rick and Steve. And we have a question from our Canadian friend, Diane Millette, and this is for Kim. Are there many barriers to pelvic health services in the U.S., whether that be access to services, payment, or available practitioners? Uh, thanks for the question, Diane. Uh, of course, you know, I can speak for being in a rural area. I mean, it's the access to finding physical therapists uh, anywhere, but also this is an entry-level skill. So we need to make sure, and the Academy is trying to um, help make sure we have enough courses out there for interested physical therapists to be able to get the training in this. As far as billing goes, you're billing your orthotic codes. I get that question a lot uh, from PTs. There's pessary codes that are for physicians, but there's the two orthotic codes for the initial uh, assessment and then the follow-up that, that we could bill for this. So as far as barriers, it really is the same as, you know, finding not only a physical therapist, but then finding someone who has the advanced training. But we're hoping to expand that to give our patients access. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, I want to thank the panel of experts that we've had, you've all been just terrific. And thank you to all the participants for tuning in to us today. Um, before you go though, we do have a couple of upcoming webinars that I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, the Physical Therapy Compact Benefit for Military Spouses, um, the NPTE redesign, and of course, Regulatory Hour with Dale in December. So thank you again for being here, and we look forward to you being here. Hopefully you're going to Jacksonville. Uh, that's next week, and I hope to see you all there. Um, but again, thank you, everyone. Bye now.